Hey guys, what's up? In this video, we're going to be talking the Hammond postulate, which was given to us by George S. Hammond way back in 1955. I'll put a link in the description to the original paper if you're so inclined to take a look at it. And as always, I'll put a link in the description to a PDF of all the notes in this video. The Hammond postulate tells us that the structure of a transition state, which is commonly abbreviated with this double dagger symbol, will more closely resemble that species on either side of it on the reaction coordinate to which it is closer in energy. A pretty simple statement, but a very powerful statement. The structure of a transition state more closely resembles that species to which it is closer in energy. Let's take a look at an exergonic reaction. Now remember, an exergonic reaction is one where the reactants are at a higher energy than the products, and so overall the reaction is going downhill. It's lowering its energy. The transition state sits at the highest energy position that separates the reactants from the products. And the question that we need to answer is, is that transition state closer in energy to the reactants or to the products? Now, obviously in this case, the transition state is closer in energy to the reactants. And the Hammond postulate tells us that the structure of that transition state will be closer to the structure of the reactants than the structure of the products. And a reactant-like transition state is often referred to as being early. Now let's consider what happens to the transition state if we were to do something to the reaction that lowers the energy of the products. That is, we're going to make the reaction even more exergonic than it was before. The transition state in this case is going to be even more reactant-like than it was before. And we can see this if we just compare the positions of the two transition states along the reaction coordinate, along the x-axis. We can see that the second reaction's transition state occurs a bit earlier than the first reaction's transition state. So again, we can see that by lowering the energy of the products and making the reaction even more exergonic, we got an even more reactant-like transition state. That is, the second transition state occurs earlier than the first transition state. And this is generally true. More exergonic reactions, or another way of saying it, less endergonic reactions, have earlier and lower energy transition states. So not so bad, right? Now let's give the same treatment to an endergonic reaction. Now, recall that an endergonic reaction is one where the reactants are at a lower energy than the products, and the transition state sits on the hill in between. And we ask, is the transition state closer in energy to the reactants or to the products? In this case, the transition state is closer in energy to the products, so we have a more product-like transition state. Product-like transition states are commonly referred to as a late transition state. Let's increase the energy of the products and make the reaction even more endergonic. If we do this and we compare the positions of the two transition states along the x-axis, along the reaction coordinate, we can see that this new, more endergonic reaction has an even later transition state. That is, this reaction has an even more product-like transition state. So in the more endergonic reaction, we have a later transition state than in the less endergonic reaction. And again, this is generally true. More endergonic reactions, or less exergonic reactions, saying it another way, have later and higher energy transition states. So let's go ahead and apply these concepts to a specific example. And we can look at the dissociation of tert-butyl chloride giving the tert-butyl carbocation and chloride. If you haven't seen this specific reaction before, don't worry, you'll see it soon enough. It's operative in both the SM1 and the E1 reaction. First, we need to determine if this reaction is exergonic or endergonic, that is, are the reactants or the products at a higher energy level. Now, we're forming a carbocation, a carbon with a positive charge, a carbon without an octet. So the products, the carbocation and the chloride, are certainly going to be of higher energy than the starting material. We have an endergonic reaction. So let's go ahead and put these species on an endergonic reaction coordinate. We have our starting material at a lower energy, our products at a higher energy, and on the hill in between, we have our transition state. Now in this reaction, we're breaking the carbon-chlorine bond. 
and we can indicate this in the structure by drawing the bond as a dashed or dotted bond. So we have an endergonic reaction with a late transition state. So let's see what we can determine about the structure of this transition state based on what we've learned. So we know that the carbon bonded to the chlorine in the reactant is sp3 hybridized. And we know that the carbocation product is sp2 hybridized. Because we have a late transition state, a more product-like transition state, we would expect the transition state to be closer to sp2 hybridization than sp3. So we should expect the bond angles in the carbocation to be closer to 120 degrees, consistent with trigonal planar geometry, than 109.5 degrees, which is consistent with tetrahedral geometry. We can also look at the charges. So in the starting material, we have a zero charge. In the products, we have a positively charged carbon. And so in the transition state, being late, more product-like, we would expect there to be a significant positive charge building up on the carbon. We can also say that the carbon-chlorine bond in the transition state is more broken than it is formed because it's closer to the products where that bond is completely broken. Now, let's change the reaction conditions to make it less endergonic. We could do this by using a solvent that stabilizes the carbocation product and lowers its energy. Because we have a less endergonic reaction now, we know that the transition state is going to be a little bit earlier than it was before and also of lower energy. Now, the transition state will still be a late transition state. It will still be a product-like transition state. It will just be a little bit less product-like than it was before. Therefore, the carbon in this transition state is going to be a little bit less sp2 hybridized than it was before, and it will also have a little bit less charge than it had before. We can also say that the carbon-chlorine bond in this transition state is a little bit less broken than it was before. That is, in the first case, in the more endergonic reaction, that carbon-chlorine bond in the transition state is expected to be longer than the carbon-chlorine bond in the less endergonic reaction. Okay guys, so there you have it, the Hammond postulate. I hope you found this video helpful, and if you did, don't forget to subscribe. And like I said, you can find a link to a PDF of all the notes in this video in the description down below. Take it easy, and we'll see you next time.